Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scher. Today, my guest is Nina Teicholz. Now, she probably needs no introduction, but of course, I'll introduce her anyway. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She's a journalist. She's written extensively on um, the nutrition guidelines and the process behind the nutrition guidelines. And she's an excellent investiga- investigative journalist, digging up topics and conflicts of interest and things that would really go unnoticed if she wasn't there digging and finding all the information. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today, about the process of the dietary guidelines, why they matter, where it's break, where the process is breaking down, and more importantly, what we can do about it as individuals and what message we can share that can help bring science back into the dietary guidelines. So quickly, she's the founder of the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit working to ensure nutrition policies are based on the best and rigorous science. Um, you can find her on Twitter at, the Big, at Big Fat Surprise. Um, I highly recommend following her. And of course, on Substack, which you're going to hear us talk about, uh, she has a column called Unsettled Science. So without further ado, let's get into this interview, which is always interesting, uh, with Nina Teicholz. Nina Teicholz, welcome back to the Diet Doctor podcast. It's great to have you join us again. Thank you, Brett. It's great to be here. Now, I remember at our last podcast, we spent a bit of time discussing why the dietary guidelines matter. And I hope people will go back and listen to that episode. But I wanted to start this discussion with a tweet that was put out by Ty Beal, who's also been on the podcast and on some of our videos. And basically, it was a tweet about what his daughter, going to a a public elementary school in Los Angeles, is getting for school meals. And so for breakfast, she gets a cinnamon roll with chocolate milk. And then for lunch, she gets pizza and chicken tenders and biscuits. And this is a meal. These are meals and food choices approved by the you know unified school district in Los Angeles based on the dietary guidelines. So I think that really highlights just so simplistically why the di- dietary guidelines matter. Now, on our, also on our last podcast, we talked about this NASEM study um, that was done in 2017 that um, made a number of recommendations about how the dietary guidelines could be improved. And you recently wrote an article that basically said none of these recommendations have been fully implemented. So why don't we kick it off with that, even though a little depressing, but to hear to hear yeah. your take on what you wrote in that article, which was co-authored by some big names with um, Ronald Krauss and, and Jeff Volek and, and others, that, that what were these recommendations that were not implemented and why do you think they were not implemented and what can we do about that? Well, I mean, just starting with the school breakfast and school lunches for a moment, let's just linger on that for a second. The guidelines are our nation's top nutrition policy, which by law is required to be followed by all federal nutrition programs. So there's very little leeway that local schools have if they're accepting federal money. They allow 10% of calories of all your calories as sugar and they require six servings of grains per day, including three servings of refined grains. So that is crazy. And what these schools are doing is taking, uh, you know, the entire grains allotment and the and the sugar allotment and sticking it in there, the meals that they provide to these children. I mean, to start your day with a chocolate, <laughs> whatever pastry, and often there's orange juice is just really a travesty for kids. Um, and we see that in obesity yeah. and diabetes epidemic, you know, the numbers and, 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 uh, and for poor kids, that's often, you know, the only meals that they get, uh, and they're not getting anywhere near their protein requirement. So how did we get here? I mean, it's a crazy situation. This is happening to kids, people in nursing homes, in hospitals, this is the food followed by the military. I mean, it is so pervasive. And if you think, I don't know. I don't follow the guidelines and they don't matter to me. You know, if you or anybody in your life thinks that more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, low fat, dairy, and lean meat is the formula for success, that is the guidelines. So that is, I mean, that's it in a nutshell, delivered by nutritionists and doctors and everyone. So what we've had this policy that is virtually unchanged since 1980 in the US. We have exported it to many nations, virtually the same policy in many countries around the world. And due to the work of this group that I found in 2015 called the Nutrition Coalition, our major effort was to get really 
the first ever outside review of the dietary guidelines ever done. And this was what uh, resulted in, we were able to persuade Congress, just review the guidelines process, like find out what's happening there. And is that good science? That resulted in what you called NASM, but it's the National Academies of Sciences, the most elite prestigious body of medicine in the United States. They did two reports really that came out in 2017 funded by Congress, mandated by Congress saying, and Congress said, we want the recommendations coming out of this report to be implemented before the next dietary guidelines. Well, not only were they brushed off by the USDA for the 2020 guidelines, they have been brushed off, it seems, you know, for any of the guidelines. Um, so we were able to get a follow-up report by, again, by the National Academies of Sciences to say what's happened with the original 2017 report, right? And that report that came out earlier this year said uh, of the seven recommendations, none had been implemented and one of them, there was not enough information to tell. So this is a pretty sad state of affairs. Um, and what were those recommendations? Well, the report said, number one, probably the most important one was the dietary guidelines process. It does not follow any recognizable methodology that it, that we, we, there's no, it's not a validated methodology. Why does methodology matter? I mean, in simple terms, it's like you need a rule book to play a soccer game or a football game. You need to know what are the rules and everybody comes into the game with the same expectation. It's obviously far more complex in science, but there are a number of methodologies or systems for reviewing science that are, that are rule books. You know, these randomized clinical controlled trials are more rigorous evidence on the whole than epidemiological studies, which I'm sure your audience knows something about. Um, we have to analyze these studies for potential bias. We have to ensure that they're being they're being weighted properly. We can we cannot include. Um, we have to grade evidence according to certain criteria. That is not happening in the process that produces the guidelines, and we you know that is just overtly obvious to anybody who has spent any time with the science. And recognizes, I mean, as I've done, I've probably, you know, I've spent far too much of my life probably reading all the dietary guidelines reports. But I can say, for instance, that the largest ever clinical trial on the low fat diet called the Women's Health Initiative on almost 50,000 women with results in 2006, and which showed the low fat diet did not have a positive impact on any health outcome that they looked at, including cancer, which it was unusually for an experiment powered to look at cancer outcomes, but also heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, that low fat diet was not successful. And that clinical trial has never shown up in any of the review processes that have gone on every five years to update the guidelines. So that's, and I could give you really most of the clinical trials, right? The most rigorous kind of evidence yeah. that we have yeah. funded by the National Institutes of Health, none of them are in the evidence base of the dietary guidelines. So, so let me ask you though, who is, who is um, responsible for responding to these uh, recommendations by, by the National Academy of Science study? And who is responsible for explaining why this is the case? Because when you say it, it's like so blatantly obvious, how could they not do this? But they must have a reason. So is there someone or some governing body who has said, this is why we do it the way we do it? The U.S. Department of Agriculture is the agency that is mainly in charge of the dietary guidelines. They, although the lead agency oscillates between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services for every five-year revision, it is inside the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, that the office sits where maybe 25 people run the dietary guidelines, do the scientific reviews. They're the experts on all of this. So it really is the, it's the USDA that has to respond. The USDA did issue a written response to Congress. And again, this was the work of the Nutrition Coalition to sort of force a written response because we wanted to see 
what were the reasons? And, you know, their reasons are, well, you know, we're doing enough on this front or, you know, we are updating our methodology and our methodology is, um, you know, we've done a, a few things here and there. It's, it's, it's kind of incomplete answers that are also excuses for why they haven't done what they've done. I mean, to give you another, you know, a specific example, one of the recommendations that came out of the National Academies report was telling the USDA, you need to disclose the conflicts of interest, the ties to the food and pharmaceutical, especially the food companies that are on the expert committee reviewing the guidelines, right? You need to disclose this because that's standard scientific pra practice now for right. any guidelines committee process, right? USDA does not disclose conflicts of interest, uh, which is extraordinary. They said their response to Congress was, we don't want to disclose the conflicts of interest of the nominees, like everybody who's nominated to the committee, because that will be too arduous a process and could dissuade people from, from applying for the committee. And they they didn't address the fact that they, you know, well, okay, maybe that's excusable for the nominees, but what about the people who are actually selected? The yeah. actual people sitting on the committee, that issue they didn't address. They sort of dodged that question. Well, and that's very important because this is where your investigative journalism really comes into play because that's another paper you published that there was conflicts of interest in 95% of the committee members with the majority having over 20 relation over 20 relationships with industry including Kellogg's Kraft General Mills Dannon so it took someone like you with your colleagues to do the research to find out this tremendous number of conflicts of interest but the USDA says no it's not important we're not going to list that we don't think it's it it, it matters so there, there's such a disconnect there that's so frustrating. And I guess one of the questions is like, what can we do about it? And I guess that's what Nutrition Coalition is spending a good amount of their time is trying to to identify problems like this and and get the word out so people can do something about it. But it's from my end standpoint, it's so frustrating that you had to do this work, that the USDA wouldn't do it. So, I mean, what do you think we can do or next steps about this? The Nutrition Coalition is um, has been involved and will be involved in the future in applying the pressure from people like you and me, but you know, we have we have we have five thousand doctors who are on our mailing list, um, and we have um, we have tens of thousands of people like your listeners. Please go to the Nutrition Coalition, nutritioncoalition.us, and sign up for the newsletter, which is how you will get you will be informed of opportunities. And we have we have issued petitions. We most recently, um, and I think that there was a post from the diet doctor encouraging your followers to help along with this. And I'm pleased to be able to report to your to your listeners and viewers that uh, I think that quite a number of people from the diet doctor helped out in this effort, which was to send to issue a to make a formal public comment, the comment period that followed when the USDA said, okay, these are the scientific questions we're going to ask for the next dietary guidelines, which will come out in 2025, the process is now underway. That list of scientific questions did not include a single query on low carb diets, right? Let me give you a little bit of background here because this is so astounding. Um, and I, I wrote this piece uh, for my new Substack column, um, which is called Unsettled Science, and it's on the Substack website for anybody who's interested in signing up for that, currently free. What I found was that in two th for the 2020 guidelines, the USDA reviewed the science on low carb, or they said they reviewed it, they couldn't find a single study, right? They said, we can't find any studies. How that's defensible, I mean, they use some kind of inclusion or exclusion criteria that clearly was not responsive to the science. It's hard to believe that any of the 20 members on that committee would not understand that this was a mistake. I mean, you have to really have your head in a box not to know that there are studies coming out on low-carbohydrate diets, including that one member of the committee, Lydia Bazzano, had authored a paper on, on, on the low-carb diets that had been funded by the National Institutes of Health. So that was a crazy outcome and indefensible. And yeah. 2015, the time before that, I found through uh, emails that I got through the Freedom of Information Act 
request uh, that they had secretly reviewed the low carb diet and that in that review, they had found 43 studies. They had decided to bury that, um, that review. One member of the committee uh, Frank Koo from Harvard piped up to say in the email, I don't think you should be burying this review. And that's sort of where the conversation ends. But he's saying this is a large body of scientific literature. It's this low carb diet looks very promising for weight loss. People will ask us why are we not reviewing this information? So that was the fate in 2015, 2020, as I just said, they tried to review it, but they couldn't even find the four, 43 studies that they had found five years earlier. Couldn't find so them. That's hilarious. Like the imagery of them looking for these studies, but they can't find them somehow. Right. Like, <laughs> except, except for the ones they can't find in their own back pocket that they found before. Yeah. And all the USDA officials that are on this email chain are the, have continued through and they're, you know, so they are, they're the same people at USDA who, who, you know, could not have forgotten well, now, they did. Okay, so so let's let's rewind a second for these low carb studies though, because so you know some of them are in people with type two diabetes. So don't they exclude any studies with people in type two diabetes? And some of them are specific weight loss studies. And don't they exclude weight loss studies? But I mean, when you're excluding all these studies, like what's left? What studies can they look at? And is it just is it just these large population epidemiologic studies, and that's it? And they like purposely exclude everything else? The inclusion and exclusion criteria are really not consistent in any way. They, they, uh, you know, they, in the 2020 guidelines, they decided to exclude all studies on weight loss. Another crazy unscientific and decision that was based on this idea, which does have some scientific reality to it, which is that weight loss is a confounding factor that doesn't maybe doesn't help you to understand the other impacts of the diet. But weight loss is a part of healing um, from metabolic ill health. So that was a insane decision, I think. Um, you know, we're at a time when 70% of the country has is has is overweight or has obesity. So um, but like they'll they they do say we don't want because where the dietary guidelines are not for treatment, we cannot look at the primary outcomes of studies. In other words, if there's a study that is designed to look at diabetes, we cannot look at the outcomes on diabetes, which is the primary outcome. Instead, we'll look at the secondary or tertiary outcomes for which the study was not designed. It's that, that reasoning is also crazy on many levels. You should look at the, at the outcomes that the study was designed for and and moreover, I think the easier point to understand here is that these criteria are not con uh, consistent across studies. So for all of the studies that went in to look at the, the DASH diet, all of those DASH studies, they looked at the primary outcomes. They are short-term studies. They looked at the primary outcomes. When they're looking at low carb, they don't look at primary outcomes and they rule out any studies that are uh, shorter than, I think it was six months. So that would have ruled out all the DASH studies, right? But they include all the DASH studies. So it's, it's, there's just absolutely no sense, sense making of the science that is, goes on in this process at all. But I just yeah. want to finish up my story about yeah. what you can do, what people can do, which is that when the list of scientific questions came out and didn't include anything on low carb for this current process, we asked people to submit public comments. 70% of all the public comments were by listener viewers like yours saying, please ask some, you know, please analyze low carb diets. 70% of all, all comments were about low carb and that number would have been higher, but the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners submitted a single comment, but it was signed by 400 doctors. Oh, wow. So that would have been additional. I mean, there were only, say, a few thousand comments that would have dramatically increased the numbers. But there, it's clear that, that um, this is not a scientific process. And in terms of just thinking about change, the change, the momentum for change, the desire for change has come from Congress. So thus far, and I think we'll continue to have to because the USDA for so many reasons uh, is just not 
equipped to be a critic of itself or to or to reform, I think, its process. It's clearly shown that it has no desire to reform its process. Yeah, I mean, as we talk about, you know, being in your own bubble, your own echo chamber, and it sounds like that's what the USDA is, and and maybe asking for outside input, but not listening to it, not listening to the NASM study, not listening to to the uh, 70% of comments that were, were, were submitted. So they really sound like they, they need a great deal of oversight. So if that is coming from Congress, I guess that's something we can all can do is talk to our, our congressmen, our congresswomen, and, and, and emphasize the importance of this. And, and not just the importance of low carb, but the importance of improved science. I mean, that's just absurd how, how poor this, the rigors of the science are. But then when we talk about government and government and nutrition, now the new one is this White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, which you recently posted is completely secretive. There's no agenda. There's nothing that's been released about it. And it's being organized or, or led, I guess, by the same person who put out that food compass that, that Dr. Mazafarian from Tufts, who put out the food compass saying that Honey Nut Cheerios and Lucky Charms are healthier than, you know, eggs and meat, and <laughs> which is also sort of mind-blowing. Um, so it just, it reeks of conflict of interest again, and it reeks of sort of the same, the same process of the USDA. So tell us about this White House conference and what, it, what we know about what it hopes to accomplish and kind of what we fear may happen with it. Yes, this is a post that I just put out on Friday again at the, on Substack, called Unsettled Science is the newsletter. It is astonishing, even just before I got on the call uh, with you, that uh, nine days away from the conference and there's still no agenda, no information about participation in person. There's, uh, there's just, there's no details. And you can imagine the vast number of conflicting agendas that want to be at the table. And the whole run up to the conference has been dominated largely by Darush Mozafarian. He's the dean of the Tufts um, Friedman School of, Nu- of Nutrition Science and Policy. He um, he's very powerful, and a in that he has really dominated the process of the of what's going on with nutrition in Washington and the lead up to this conference. He's the one, the lead testifier at every hearing. He's the person who's convened all the groups that have come together. One was under the Bipartisan Policy Center in DC. So, and he's, um, you know, if you try to read the tea leaves for what this conference will yield, it's quite confusing because, you know, on the one hand, there's this, a big, a lot of conversation about food is medicine. That seems completely right to people like you and me. We said, yes, food is medicine. We should be prescribing better diets rather than relying on prescribing drugs. I mean, we should be reversing disease rather than managing them through drugs. And that is what Mozafarian will talk about, which sounds like music to my ears. We need more and better nutrition. But the, you know, the devil is in those details. What is his, what is what is the version of food as medicine that's being promoted? Well, this is a little um, sad and actually gets back to the, sto- the this question of the dietary guidelines. It turns out that if the government is going to promote more nutrition, they, well, they want nutrition and training in medical schools. Again, sounds like a good idea. More nutrition, more food delivered to poor people, more, um, you know, more information about nutrition. They want all the nutrition information coordinated in a single federal agency. However, the law states that all nutrition in any government program has to follow the dietary guidelines. So what is food as medicine? It's more of the dietary guidelines. It's more of the same. Yeah. Even in a, you know, there's a $2 million being proposed as an appropriation for the coming fiscal year for food as, a food as medicine pilot program. And what is in that, that language? It says the only thing it says about specifically about food is that it should be organic. It doesn't say anything about, you know, anything else about the food that should be in that program. So, you know, we can all agree food is medicine, but it, it really, um, you know, it really depends on which food. Just to give you another data point on that, there was a whole series of food as medicine conferences at which Darush Mozafarian, again, was the keynote speaker at all of these all across the U.S. 
And he was the first keynote speaker. Who came after him? The CMO of PepsiCo at every oh, con. Same guy. What is his idea of food as medicine? Probably, yeah. probably not what you and I would think. Right. So cynical about the outcomes of this conference. There's also a tremendous amount of investor money at the table, people looking for new devices, new startups, new new regulations that will allow greater investment, maybe in more personalized medicine. Maybe, I mean, maybe some of that will be good, but there's a tremendous kind of Silicon Valley and investor presence at this conference. Just to rewind for a second, though, you said the only thing that, that's been... Um specified about the food as medicine movement is that it has to be organic, which really caught my attention because look, if you can afford organic, I think it's, it's good from an environmental standpoint and from a potential health standpoint, but there is no data to suggest organic food is any healthier than conventionally raised food. I mean, if you are trying to be a, a evidence-based data supported, um, agency and making recommendations, organic is the last place you would go, but you're saying that's the only thing that's been spelled out. I find that, I find that wild. Um, well, this is, you know, a pilot program maybe to be developed TBD, but maybe this is the only language that everybody could agree upon. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know the full process behind that, but I know that other food as medicine efforts, first of all, I looked up the data, that supports food as medicine, which has been collated, um, collated by a Harvard group. Um, interestingly, a, a Harvard group on law and policy, nothing about nutrition, right? These are people who are interested in food law and maybe particularly interested in the environment. There are only three small clinical trials on food as medicine showing very mixed outcomes. So the actual evidence base on this is very poor, right? And, and then there's an Aspen Institute report that I um, found that is talking about we, the, the idea uh, that they need to do be more research and their needs to, on food as medicine and what should that look like. And, and you can see that that report really is formed by the realization, oh, it has to follow the guidelines. What we're talking about is food as medicine as defined by the guidelines. So Unfortunately, although it's been rebranded as food as medicine, I think we're looking at just more of the same. I think that is, sounds unfortunately correct, that it's it's multiple multiple divisions of more as the same. And to go back to this White House conference real quick, it's, it's hunger, nutrition, and health. And I think it's interesting that hunger and health are both in the equation because I think your approach has to be a little bit different when it comes to hunger and health and combining them could... Um, could complicate things to try and come up with one solution, which brings me to the point though of why are we looking for one solution, right? You mentioned that um, the dietary guidelines are geared towards people who do not have type two diabetes or pre-diabetes or who, who have obesity. They're not geared toward that person, they're geared towards sort of the healthy average person. Well, the average person is no longer healthy. So I think what we need to do is get away from trying to have a blanket recommendation and instead talk about more individualized interventions depending on the person's baseline characteristics. So, I mean, that must have been brought up at some point in, these, in all these reviews of the guidelines and recommendations. And does the USDA, do they even acknowledge that their recommendations don't apply to the majority of the population anymore? The answer is no. If if you look at the website, if you follow the recordings of the meetings, the USDA officials get up and say, these are for all Americans. All Americans should abide by the guidelines. It is too complicated for them and a real hot potato political issue for them to acknowledge that they're only for healthy people. In other words, people who are not diagnosed with a chronic disease. I mean, the official statistic is that 60% of Americans have been diagnosed with one or more chronic diseases. That's an old number. It is almost certainly much higher than that. And as I'm sure you know, there have been other studies more recently that show that only 7 or 8% of Americans are metabolically healthy, you know, as defined by a number of different risk factors and right. taking medication for them. So the, the, the number of healthy people is vanishingly small. I mean, I just wanted to make a comparison. When the guidelines were launched in 1980, something like 13% of Americans had obesity. 
We're now pushing 43%, and it's very likely hard, higher because, again, that's an old statistic pre-pandemic. But it's a very delicate issue. The, the National Academies report that came out in 2017 had kind of very vague language about how the guidelines really need to do more to address chronic diseases in America or risk being irrelevant. Um there's interest there's interestingly there's currently a proposal being shopped around on Capitol Hill that would create an alternative dietary guidelines for unhealthy Americans. Hmm. That would but you can imagine what a threat that poses to the dietary guidelines because Let's say that 93% of the population <laughs> moves over to these other guidelines, right? The guidelines are not just a set of recommendation. They're like a feeding trough for large food companies. So yeah. $800 billion a year at least is spent on these feeding programs like school lunches. If you're a company like PepsiCo, who has a whole K through 12 website on what they call their passion to please the, um, the school community that includes things like Doritos, Tostitos, Lay's, um, you know, they just a, a kind of a, a horrific menu of junk food items. But if you've got those contracts, those are huge lucrative contracts. I once met a, a, a guy who was doing launching a cereal company and his whole goal was just to get one contract with the federal government because he said this will if i get this i'm you know home free i'm made so there's a tremendous investment by the food industry in maintaining the guidelines as they are they have their contracts are sewn up and there's a, tr a tremendous resistance towards changing that which is why those companies invest in nutrition scientists and they invest in the kinds of scientists who are likely to be chosen to be on the dietary guidelines committees. And, you know, that was one of the interesting findings of our paper. I just want to spend a second on that for your listeners. Yeah, please, um, please. The 15 top industry actors who contribute to the members that we found contributing to the members of the dietary guideline advisory committee, the number one one was something called ILSI, the, the Institute for Life Sciences, um, or International Life Sciences Institute. That is the group that has made headlines over and over in the New York Times about promoting the, you know, the sugar agenda. And they were very much involved in the energy balance effort, this idea that all calories are the same, doesn't matter what you eat, calories in, calories out, that was their platform. They are a trade group of the largest multinational food companies in the world. Um, so they are in there, they had, um, they had, donated, given research funds or paid for in some way or had a scientific advisor to 11 members of the committee, which is more than half of them. They had trustees who, who were on the committee. They had their scientific advisor on the committee. And after that, it's interesting to see who comes to the top. The California Walnut Commission um, had, had um, 33 conflicts of interest on the committee. This is now just the number of times they've given to members. Dannon, which is a huge company that produces food and beverages, General Mills, Nestle Healthcare, and Nestle itself um, are two different companies. Um, and then any kind of recognizable real food item, the, 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 the trade association that was listed at the top was the American Egg Board, um, who had given to, I think, maybe just a couple members of the committee, but had, had donated quite a lot to their efforts. So, I mean, what you're seeing here, the companies at the top are the large multinational packaged yeah. food companies. And, um, you know, although you do see egg and pork and beef, but they're just not as influential as these other companies. And um, I do want to mention to, pe to folks who've maybe seen this paper and feel like they've read it or they're not interested that we're going to very soon post on the Nutrition Coalition website a new searchable map that you can, you can kind of play with. It's a network map that you, that shows all the different companies and their networks with all the different, uh, people on the committee. It's a really fun, interesting tool. <laughs> and it's, um, it just kind of shows you the webs that exist, the networks yeah. that exist, but 
amongst different companies. Yeah, it, it just boggles my mind, though, that if you and the Nutrition Coalition weren't doing this, that nobody would be. And all this would just be secret and swept under the rug and nobody would know any different. And, and that, that boggles my mind. And I always believe that if you're setting a guideline, so for me, it's always been if you're setting the cholesterol guidelines, the statin guidelines, the blood pressure guidelines, to be on that guideline committee, you should have a clean uh, disclosure. You should have no... Uh, association with big phar- with pharmaceutical companies or or other companies, um, it, but of course that falls on deaf e- deaf ears and their conflicts of interest are are a, a laundry list. And I think absolutely even more so the same should be for the dietary guidelines. So if they said if they did that if they said all of a sudden you can have zero conflicts of interest to be on the di- dietary guidelines would they I mean I guess their argument would probably be we won't find any experts cuz everybody has a conflict of interest so what do you think I mean would there be people who they could who could fill those roles and have the background in science and nutrition and and health and be able to fill out the guideline the guidelines committee without conflicts of interest um that's a good question and I I want to mention to people that the the National Academy's standard for clinical guidelines is pretty low. It says that half of your member, 50% of the members on the committee can have a conflict of interest. I mean, here we, we're seeing on the Dietary Guidelines Committee, 95% have a conflict of interest. Yeah. So they're way over the top. But 50% is still pretty high in my view. Um, but it is possible to manage conflicts of interest. You can say, look, here we have a situation where... Um, the the let's say the grains and packaged food companies have a, a, a compete with um, uh, natural animal foods. Um, you can try to balance those on the committee, or to give a more I think an easier to understand example. Let's say you balance the margarine manufacturers with the butter interest. I mean, you can try to create some balance on the committee. In the analysis that I did, I saw one member of the committee who had clear, uh, who had done quite a lot of research on protein. She'd worked on, her name is Heather Lighty. She'd worked on eggs. She'd worked with meat. She worked with a number of companies and she was funded by those industries, but she was the only one out of 20. Everybody else was heavily slanted towards manufactured food companies Um, or uh, There was another member who was almost all nuts. I mean, every possible nut industry, pecan shellers, the peanuts, walnuts, everybody was contributing to that person. But that person who believes in nuts as the ideal protein, who, by the way, is a Seventh-day Adventist, that person should be balanced against the meat protein person. Um, and you, you can, I would, you could roughly try to do some balancing out of different conflicts. But I think it's um, it's not easy, and I should also mention that that you know there's no consideration really, or no thought, or real understanding of all the influences by the pharmaceutical industry. Right. So there was because they, it's not clear why they would have conflicts of interest to most people. But of course, they're creating the drugs and devices that are created to manage these illnesses rather than to actually treat and reverse them. So there was right. one member named Jamie Yard, who has been um, the medical director since uh, for at least a decade of Optifast, which is a formula-based meal program that is, is a product of Nestle. And he's received, I think, you know, practically a million dollars, at least that he's disclosed for, um, for promoting getting research funds for those products. What is the conflict there? Well, if you're invested in a formula-based solution to obesity, you might be less open or excited about a food-based solution to obesity. Right. Just one right. example. Maybe we can all think of the insulin manufacturers or the um, any number of um, pill manufacturers. But additional conflict of interest to get millions of dollars from the same agencies that produce the guidelines. So what we found in our analysis was also it was we looked at their government contracts most of the people on the committee including the one person who had no industry conflicts they were getting many many millions of dollars from the government the same agency that issues the guidelines so what is their um and what is their their desire to then to cause a stir, to raise a hand, to question, to to undermine the guidelines in any way, 
when they're worried about their whole career depends on getting this this funding from either USDA or National Institutes of Health. So um, I think that's another conflict of interest. It's, yeah. it's, it's very tricky territory, I have to say. So do you think we could ever have an independent um, committee, an independent group come up with their own guidelines? Now, it wouldn't have the stickiness as the government ones because you couldn't mandate laws you know, that go against the, the government ones. But as a start, do you think that could ever happen, that a group big enough could form an independent guidelines and not just a low-carb you know, low guideline, but an independent nutrition guidelines with – people without conflicts of interest from different different areas of nutrition to come together and say, we think these are better guidelines and sort of submit them to Congress, submit them to the USDA. Could you ever foresee that happening? Not being able to have them submitted and, and adapted by the government, which is so invested in the guidelines. It's certainly possible. I mean, the American Diabetes Association is has been tentatively coming out with uh, a lower carb or low carb option for people with type two diabetes. And, but, um, and so it's possible that we see a proliferation of guidelines in various interest groups treating each kind of chronic condition. You could see it maybe with the, the, you know, the association for fatty liver disease or, or any of these other groups, but I don't see that as being adopted and as part of the government, because it would be against the law. I mean, the current yeah. law would need to be changed for that to happen. It is possible that, but I think not probable, <laughs> that um, evidence-based experts, in other words, the people who know, maybe don't know a lot about nutrition, but know a lot about how to review science, methodology experts, could be appointed to the committee and sort of be like a referees on the committee, like going back to our sports analogy, like, hey, yeah. you're off sides, you know, or whatever that is. And they could bring a kind of rigor to the committee. And in fact, the Nutrition Coalition has nominated in the past, uh, for the past guidelines, and we again nominated him for this go around, John Ioannidis, who's a methodology expert at, at Stanford University. We nominated Gordon Guyatt the same one of the co-founders of GRADE, which is a methodology in, um, that comes out of Canada, now used by more than 200 public health institutions. So I think that is a possible way forward um, where somebody with a lot of backbone could stand up and say, you know, hey, flag down on that play. <laughs> right. <laughs> they would be very busy. Oh my goodness. They yes. would be very busy throwing <laughs> flags all over the place left and right. But, but I, and I really like that approach because again, it's not, you're promoting someone who's going to, who has a low carb agenda or has a specific agenda other than science. Their agenda is science and scientific integrity. And I think that's so important. Um, and a big part of your movement. So in talking about scientific integrity, you also published another paper. You've been very busy with all these publications, um, talking about the contradictions between sort of what they say the science says and then what their recommendation is. Like, you know, there's not enough science to say dietary cholesterol is an issue, but then their recommendation is keep dietary cholesterol as low as possible. And of course, saturated fat comes up time and time again. So tell us about the contradictions that you right. uncovered that are like just prevalent throughout the guidelines? Well, it's really on the subjects about uh, that are the most important recommendations, the most longstanding, the ones that have most form our, formed our ideas about a healthy diet. So that is dietary cholesterol, saturated fat, and overall fat, right? They have, they contradict themselves right and left over these. Um, and so you just mentioned dietary cholesterol. The formal review in 2020 said they found they did a they did a formal systematic review. They said they found insufficient evidence to support a relationship between the cholesterol you eat and the cholesterol levels in the blood. So that's your dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. Yet their advice was to keep dietary cholesterol quote as low as possible unquote, based not on based their on formal what. <laughs> based on their, you know, based on epidemiological studies, which they say the study of you know, the diets that tend to do well in epidemiological studies tend to be lower in cholesterol. On the low fat diet, since the year 2000, the guidelines have not used any low fat language in the guidelines. I know this is a subject that our um, late friend Adele Height um, spoke about quite a lot because, and she and yeah. I had different opinions about that. And I realized in retrospect, because 
the guidelines themselves are so unbelievably contradictory. You could, you know, you could take opinions on, on any side because the guidelines are confusing. So there's no low fat wording, but the expert report said that diets that are generally associated with dyslipidemia. So we know that to mean like you, um, your lipids are off, your cholesterol markers are off and are indicators of increased risk of heart disease. Um, they said that low fat diets cause that. So in other words, low fat diets are causing heart disease, according to the expert review. They also said the low fat diet, quote, could engender an overconsumption of calories in the form of carbohydrates, resulting in the adverse metabolic consequences of high carb diets, unquote. And the chair of the 2015 committee said there's no conventional message to recommend low-fat diets, right? So you think, oh, low-fat diet, it's over now, right? Yeah. However, the 2020 guidelines came out and said, keep your fat to between 20 to 35% of calories. And so that's de facto basically where a low-fat diet, how it's always been defined in the literature, maybe up to 33%, but I mean, it's basically been in that range. So they're still recommending a low-fat diet. On saturated fats, this was perhaps the most astonishing one. Um, they found, um, they did a review in 2020, and I did a, a separate paper actually looking at uh, where we did like an analysis. We looked at, we listed all the studies that they had reviewed for that, that formal review something between 85 to 100% of them did not support the idea that saturated fat or the fat and meat dairy uh, or dairy caused any negative outcome in terms of heart disease. And in the studies that they reviewed on stroke found what we usually find on stroke, which is saturated fats. The more saturated fats you eat, the lower your risk of stroke. And yet the committee defying and ignoring its own review results said the evidence against saturated fats was strong, that these fats cause heart disease, caused heart disease. Again, relying on nutritional nutrition epidemiology studies and saying that that level of evidence is strong, which is just so off base. It does not comply with any international standard for scientific reviews to elevate epidemiological studies to that level of, of causality when the, the, the associations that are found are so tiny, you know, very, yeah. very tiny association is not strong yeah. enough to assume causation. So, um, and again, this was like, this, this was maybe 80 studies and all of them <laughs> did not find that saturated fats was even associated with heart disease. So they were not only, they were, they were flipping that science on its head and using it incorrectly. I mean, sort yeah. of double so, um, you know, I think we're, what we're seeing is a situation where the science that we have all seen come, come up in the last really 10, 15 years, right? A revision of our understanding about saturated fats, um, new data on low fat diets, uh, a new thinking about dietary cholesterol that overturns what we've believed in generally in the scientific community since the 1960s. That new science, it, it's percolated among in the scientific community, but it is having it's hit a glass ceiling on its way uh, up to being adopted by policy. So let's timestamp this in history. We're at a point in history now where the distrust of the government and certainly the distrust of the government as it relates to science is probably the highest it has ever been. So strangely, is this an opportunity to push this further to really kind of use this as a, uh, to shine the light and say, look, we, we've seen how the government can be misleading with how it handles evidence in other areas, or, you know, maybe we can't trust everything they say. And here is one more area. Do you see this as like a, a an opportunity because of the timing? Definitely the events of the past two years and the flip-flopping on the science has opened, uh, has created um, a kind of fertile landscape for people questioning other forms of public health policy. My fear is that this issue, like so many that we are seeing in public health and elsewhere, will become very politically polarized. Because mm. what you have right now, I mean, it may change um, with the elections, with the next administration, but right now the defenders of the public health policy are Democrats, the questioners are Republicans, and, and, and that's true for any public health policy. So, I, you know, 
we should, it should not be a partisan issue. I mean, health yeah. is something that's important to everyone, reversing the tide of chronic disease, the $350 billion a year we're spending on diabetes. That's the largest. Um, it's, it's by far and away what's most likely to bankrupt our government. That should be a bipartisan issue. But, um, but, you know, that's the challenge as you go ahead, especially with this White House conference on health, which will have the Biden stamp of approval on it. And um, whatever comes out of that will uh, be a political product, unlikely to embrace anything that we know about metabolic health. One of the things that I wrote in my column was that nobody from the metabolic health community has been invited. I mean, nobody on the front lines of treating any of the diseases that this conference aims to combat. Um, there's just nobody there. So I, I you know, I, so yes, I mean, I'm hopeful, but I think it's going to be a political battle. Yeah. So every time I talk to you, I am just fired up and charged up to go write letters and call my representatives and congressmen and congresswomen and, and just start hounding them. Does that really make a difference though? I mean, can one person or, or of course not one person, but one person and then the, the hopefully thousands listening here, if they started writing and calling their representatives, um, their government representatives, could it make a difference? I do think so. I think it takes targeted action. So just a random letter to your congressman or woman is not going to make a difference to them. But it's the job of the Nutrition Coalition to organize campaigns and say to people, uh, I mean, it's part of their job, is to say to people, now's the time. We need you on this particular issue. We need you to respond in the public comments. We need you to call about the guidelines at this moment. And I do right. think that targeted campaigns help. I mean, the Nutrition Coalition was credited by numerous people for preventing the desire to f lower even further the caps on saturated fat from the current 10% of calories. And I think they will try to do that again this year. And we had we had by far and away the greatest number of individual comments, letters, um, compared to any other group that have gone into this process. We're the only, we're really the only watchdog group on the, in, in this process. So I do think it matters. Just wait for the, wait for the call. <laughs> I mean, wait for the, you know, the campaign. And then I think we all have to dive in to, uh, yeah. to influence our leaders to make a difference. You know, yeah, even congressmen, you know, they they will take notice. They, you know, they they have people sitting at the phones who's, you know, they just they'll check a check a box and say, okay, we've, you know, now we've received four hundred phone calls on this issue. We need to pay attention. Yeah. Well, I think people should follow you and the Nutrition Coalition on Twitter anyway, but even if for no other reason, just to hear the call for when that time is, because I think that's a really good point. Like I can write a letter right now because I'm fired up to do it after talking to you, but that one letter is going to have very minimal effect. But if I wait until you put, and you're so good about posting this on Twitter and on social media and say, now's the time, if everybody can can uh, take action at that time, it will have such a an impressive um, impact. And I mean- like you said, we have to improve the quality of the science. And it's not about low carb. It's not about high carb. It's not about me. It's about improved science. And uh, it, it still boggles my mind that that's such a fight to do so. So, I mean, thank you for all the work you've been doing and with the Nutrition Coalition and uh, and will continue to do, to do. So tell us like what's next for you. What are the, the big next things for Nutrition Coalition and for you and any other final thoughts? Sure. I, I'm actually no longer the director of the Nutrition Coalition and we're just in the process of hiring a new director. Um, and so that person will take over soon and, and that's not yet announced. But and I will stay on the board and plan, you know, want to stay engaged. But I'm really shifting more to going back to journalism. I mean, some of the I've started this column that I've now mentioned more than once, but it's it's a it answers both my own need to write again, which is just something I love to do personally, but also looking out there at the landscape of articles on nutrition, like I. Hardly, I almost never see an article that seems to reflect the kind of viewpoint or that I, you know, that I see. It doesn't reflect the current science. I don't see any rigorous, real rigorous investigation going on out there. I don't see anybody questioning the money. I don't, I just, I see a kind of blank in nutrition reporting. And that is, it's, it's a, there's a tremendous need to have good reporting, investigative, you know, strong, good science-based reporting on nutrition. 
So I, I hope to do that. Um, I mean, I hope to at least partially fill that void. Yeah, well, you've mentioned it a couple of times, but I'm happy to mention it again. Unsettled science on Substack because I, I, I like the work that you're doing there and I think doing more of it is only going to help because you are a phenomenal investigative journalist. I mean, you you are great at digging up these details and these conflicts of interest and, and so many things that would go unnoticed uh, if you hadn't brought it to the forefront. So thank you for doing that. And thank you again for taking the time to join us on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you, Brett. It's been great talking to you.